Hey there, welcome back to the final lesson on loving God, self, and others. And again, the overarching umbrella that holds it all together is this idea of relational spirituality. Um, and perhaps even by now you have worked on that um, Trinity assignment where you looked at the art and, and did a little bit of thinking through that piece there. Um, this last one uh, is our final destination. It, uh, it is loving others compassionately. So let's take a look at this, dive right in. Kenneth Boa, the author says, the closer our walk with God, the more we are empowered to manis manifest our love for him through acts of love and service to others. When we understand that Christ's resources are our resources, we can become secure enough to serve other people without expecting reciprocity. Big word reciprocity, just expecting something in return. It's like the whole uh, mantra, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, I do this for you, you do this for me kind of idea. It's like, that's not how it works in Christianity. You simply love other people expecting nothing in return. So loving Christ more than people increases our capacity to love, serve, forgive, and give ourselves away for people. Now that idea of loving Christ more than people might sound odd to you, and it is interesting language, but I understand what Kenneth Boa is saying here. Um, my ability to love other people is directly related with my ability to love God or Christ. And so this is what he means by that specifically. Um, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, the apostle, the beloved disciple says this, we love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So it's, it's kind of straightforward logic there from that first century disciple of Christ. He's saying, you know, people say they love God, but they don't see him. Yet at the same time, they see their neighbor, yet they hate their neighbor. He says that just doesn't really make any sense. Um, so let's kind of investigate that a little bit here. Um, what he's saying essentially is there's this horizontal and vertical relationship happening. So the vertical relationship is obviously my relationship with God and my horizontal relationship is my relationship with other people. And so my relationship, my horizontal relationship is dependent on my vertical relationship with God. So if the vertical relationship is non-existent, I can say all day long, I love other people, but that also is going to be non-existent as well. And so there are a few passages in scripture that help us understand, okay, this isn't just some dude, John the Apostle, who is trying to come up with a philosophical idea about what it means to love God and love other people. John had his journey too. And there is a little bit of background information about who John is. So you can definitely check that out on your own. And let me, uh, let me just scroll up here. And you see uh, John recognized that, hey, this is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Like John knew that Jesus loved him. That's a good place to be. Um, and at the end of the gospel, Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, John. And he basically entrusted his mother into the care of John, the, the disciple. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. So you see some interaction there between Peter and John and their excitement about Jesus at the end of the gospel. He wasn't always so excited about Jesus or he, the, the gospels don't always paint the best picture of John. They actually show the other side of John as well. And that comes from Luke chapter nine, verses 51 through 56. And here it says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Now I've mentioned this before last year in the gospel class that Jews and Samaritans didn't really get along. So whenever you see the gospel writers or really any writer in the 
New Testament. They talk about the relationship between Jews and Samaritans. They're talking about racial tension, groups that just didn't get along, groups that didn't love each other. And so when the disciples, James and, oh, look, at there's the character John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? You guys, this is the same person that wrote the Gospel of John and wrote that letter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and particularly 1st John 4, 19, that said you're supposed to love people that you see. John went through a transformation. I mean, look at the language that he's using here. He literally wanted God to destroy, or he literally wanted to be able to have the power to call fire down from heaven to destroy other people. This is where he started. Um, and Jesus didn't say, John, get away from me. I never want to see you again. Jesus knows this is kind of how we act and think about other people. And he continued to spend time with John because he knew that John needed to go through a transformation. But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, no, this isn't the way that we're supposed to think about the Samaritans. Then he and his disciples went to another village. So Jesus had to rebuke him and get him thinking on the right, in the right direction. So at one point, John the Apostle's horizontal relationships were in great need of repair. Why? Because his vertical relationship was not really the correct one. He thought God's heart was to call down fire to destroy other people. That's not a good vertical relationship. That needed repair. And the way that that was repaired was by spending time with Jesus. The more he spent time with Jesus, the more he learned about the heart of the Father. And the heart of the Father was definitely not to cast fire down from heaven to destroy the Samaritans. Jesus rebuked that and said, no. That rebuke allowed John to begin the process of vertical restoration so that he could have horizontal um, restoration as well, to the point where he could write that letter, 1 John 4, 19, and say, you know what? We love because he first loved us. You say you love God, but you don't see him, yet you see your brother and you hate him. And so the litmus test truly becomes that brother or sister or neighbor, that enemy, that person I see, do I love them? What is my response to them? to call down fire, to just get rid of them, or to love them, because that's what Jesus calls us to do. And so here in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, you see that great command, um, which is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And I, I have that here for you guys. Jesus replied, love God. And he also said, love your neighbor as yourself. That is the goal. And so Kenneth Boa says, there is no act that begins with love of God that does not end with the love of neighbor. In other words, you can't say, I love God. I'll worship God. I'll pray to God on my own, but then not really do anything to love my neighbor. If you are in the position of simply thinking, worshiping, singing, or praying and saying, I love God. I love God. I love God. But then you don't go out and do anything with that love. You don't practically go love and serve other people. Then your vertical relationship is in need of repair because definitely a horizontal relationship if you're not actually going and loving other people is in great need of repair. So I really like how he uses this language. There is no act that begins with the love of God that does not end with the love of neighbor. And that's the litmus test. That's how you know what you're saying is true. When you say, God, I love you, you actually go out and love and serve your neighbor. I think Mother Teresa is a great example of this, and perhaps in church history you can think of many more, but she is very well known um, for her acts of service and love um, to people who need a lot of love. Um, and so Mother Teresa went on record saying this, I love it. I see Jesus in every human being, because again, her perspective is people are created in God's image. And so when she goes out, she sees everybody, every human being, and she's like, there's Jesus, there's Jesus, there's Jesus. She wasn't come some crazy theologian. She just really believed the word of God and it had an impact on her life. So she says, I say to myself, this is hungry, Jesus. I must feed him. This is sick, Jesus. 
This one has leprosy or gangrene. I must wash him and tend to him. I serve because I love Jesus. And so that kind of brings it full circle for us. She serves because she just loves God. And that's the challenge for us, you know, um, and it goes back to that first teaching, loving God completely. How do we know that we really love God? What is the ultimate test of that? My interaction with other people. And do I love other people compassionately, just like God loved me? Mother Teresa in her quote here is uh, fantastic. And um, to land the plane here in John 13, 34, we see Jesus taking on the servant's robe, kneeling down before his disciples and washing their feet. Here you have the very God of the universe, the creator of the universe, who is going to come to our world, not to demand others serve him, but to show how to serve. And in showing how to serve, he gets down on his knees, down to his disciples, and not just the disciples that were going to end up being on his side. What I have here is washing your enemy's feet. Judas was there too. And Jesus washed Judas' feet. And there is a lesson for us to consider. We're not called to simply love the people that are easy to love. That is not my job as a Christian. Jesus never taught us that. He taught us to love others who might be difficult to love. And again, recalling last year, last semester in the gospel class, who were the disciples of Christ? People who were enemies with each other. He had, Phar he had Pharisees, zealots, um, he had tax collectors and fishermen, um, he even had prostitutes, um, women he started collecting as disciples, so one of the first rabbis to ever do something in his time in that way. And, and he, he brought them all together and said, now love each other. That's what they're supposed to do. And I, I think in the same way, even at a high school like Westside, we can do the same thing and say, okay, all these different cliques, you know, you, you have all your different personalities, all your different friend groups. What we ought to do is say, let's bring everybody together and love each other. That is the goal, even, even to the people that are hard to love, like I'm sure Judas was. Um, Final quote, while we, while we come to faith in Christ as individuals, we do not grow in isolation, but through the interdependence of the body of Christ. Our modern worldview is highly individualistic, autonomous, and self-serving. Like, that's what the world has to offer. Um, those are very strong terms. Individualistic, autonomous, you do your own thing, you create your own law, as we saw last year in theology, and self-serving, you do everything to please you. But as we will see, the biblical worldview is covenantal, and we use that word covenant to describe this relationship that we have with God. We covenant with him, interdependent, communal, relational, and self-transcending. So, and I like that last phrase, self-transcending, because the gospel helps me get me outside of myself to love and serve other people. That would be the goal of Christianity. So thank you again for uh, spending some time as we go over this um, last reading in uh, the first couple of weeks here for Junior Bible. We'll see you guys soon. God bless you.